Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussing Trek, where today we're going to be talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 3, talking about the best moments and whatever else about the season that we want to discuss. Like always, I'm your host, Clarence, and today on the podcast, we have none other than Cal Jones. How are you doing, sir? As always, glad to be back and interested to get into Season 3 with you guys. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this might be the one that divides the crowd a little bit. I can't wait to get into it. It should be a lot of fun. But also on the podcast, we have returning Larry Irby. How are you doing, man? Doing good. How you guys? Yeah, doing good, man. Glad to have you back, sir. So, of course, this is where we kind of go back to talk about our favorite moments, of course, of the Star Trek Discoveries. We do the countdown to the latest and final season. We're going to see how things aged over time, you know, talk a little bit about plot decisions that were made and a whole lot more, and maybe even talk about the thing that we, that shall not be talked about, the burn. <laughs> hey, we have Tasha in the chat. How you doing, Tasha? But guys, first, I want to talk a little bit of Star Trek news. And first, I will say that Section 31 filming has wrapped. So that's a good thing that the film is finally done. Well, as far as the principal photography is done on the film. So, yeah, uh, that's wrapped. And we had a little bit of a thank you from one of the actors, Rob Kaczynski. And... um, Tasha was able to garner from this picture here that this may be set in the 2250s, which I guess we kind of figured that it might be. But from this image here that says Section 31, you can see the Delta here is the Delta from the Discovery era. So maybe we're going to be back in that time for some shenanigans. So I'm definitely down for that. So that should be interesting. That should be interesting. Can't wait. Do you, you guys have any? Go ahead. I said, I'm going to ask. I said, you think we see uh, anybody from Strange New Worlds pop up? Just That would be amazing. I would hope that would happen, but you never know. You never know. Cal, do you have any thoughts on the 631 movie, sir? Uh, Giorgio, I'll be watching. <laughs> yeah, as long as it has Giorgio, you, you're there, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Michelle, yo, you are a queen. And also in the news department, we have a story coming out. And again, thanks, Tosh. Thank Tasha for posting this. You should definitely join her Discord if you're not a member of it. But in this story, we have that Star Trek Prodigy Season 2 has been re- released on France TV. Now, this is kind of weird because... The Hagmans came back and said, well, first they said that this was a leak. This was not supposed to be out. But then they came back and deleted their tweet about it. So I'm a little confused on if it should be out or shouldn't it. Uh, Apparently it's not on Netflix in France. It's on France TV. So I'm a little confused by that whole ordeal. I guess we have to wait and see more that comes out on it. But, But yeah. And there are people posting spoilers about the season already. So if you do not want to be spoiled, tread lightly. <laughs> tread lightly. Uh, does this surprise you guys that this has been leaked so early? Or I guess maybe not leaked. Who knows? We haven't got any official word on it. Yeah, it's 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 weird that I mean I I mean I'm assuming, you know, if it's in France it'll be dubbed. So yeah. that having said that, that Oof, doesn't mean that you, we can't have some type of translation to find out. But I, I don't know. That's just weird. Yeah. For me, I'm definitely staring clear because, <laughs> man, I, I do not want to be spoiled. I want to uh, see it in all this glory when it actually releases. So, And uh, Tasha states in the chat says that they were at the rap party for Section 31 uh, when that that picture was taken that we just mentioned a minute ago so yeah yeah i hope that comes out this year but th- what do you guys think do you think we we'll get the movie this year or will it be like next year sometime i would think it would probably be next year yeah. but maybe by the end of the year who knows 
yeah, just a post production and stuff. Uh, they pre they usually have a pretty long tail on their post production, so yeah, who knows when we'll when we'll actually get it. The question is: It going to be a Paramount Plus release, or is it going to be a cinematic release? Uh, I think it's going to be a made for Paramount Plus release. And man, Tasha is giving us the deets in the chat here. <laughs> she says that the Strange New Worlds cast was at the Section Thirty One rap party. Mm, that's huh. cool. Interesting. Interesting. So that might lead some, put some fuel on the fire that we may see these guys somewhere in the Section Thirty One movie. Now it could be that it's just all shot in Toronto together so that could be the reason but still <laughs> yeah I, I think the possibility is is definitely open as they were shooting both of these kind of at the same time so let me ask you this after just watching season three i actually thought this while watching in this section 31 movie and i think the possibility is more like an improbability not a possibility but do you think we will ever see in some type of star trek's version of wibbly wobbly timey wimey a reunion of some sort between barnum and Giorgio? man i would hope but um you know they've been going the rounds with the media and the press for the upcoming fifth season and whenever they ask uh, Sonequa Martin-Green about her continued contributions to the Star Trek universe, she always says there's a possibility that she'll come back. But then she comes back right behind that and says that, but we're so far in the future, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, this is a science fiction space show. I'm sure there's ways it could happen. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would hope. I would hope at some point we will see some type of reunion with those characters. Sweet. And who who knows who Giorgio will be down the line. Um, but yeah. So guys, do we want to move? Do you, do you guys have any news or anything you want to bring up before we get into our best moments from season three? Nope. If not, let's go ahead and get right into it. Our top moments of Star Trek Discovery season three. The season where they go off into the far future and try to restore the Federation. Larry, do you let me first off actually do you have do you have five items? How many items do you have? Because we've been doing five since you've been out. Um, I can do five. I can Okay. I can well, do five. Okay. Well, would you like to go first, sir? Well, before before we go first, let me do this. Let me say this about season three. Michelle Paradise was promoted to co-showrunner, mm. joining Kurtzman in season three. Just yes. An, just a background observation made before we get into thoughts. Yes. Yeah. The okay. I, I can go on a tangent, but yeah, the tone has been di very different since she's been a showrunner. But I digress. Uh, why don't you start us off, Cal? And we'll go in our normal fashion, five to one. Give me your fifth top. Best top moment from season three. Okay. So my number five would be Tilly's growth as a character. Mm. You know, mm. I, I know I've said each week that we've done this, you know, starting off with the apology to um, the actor who plays Tilly and then to how much I'm enjoying Tilly to I'm really enjoying the growth of the character of Tilly. I, I thought it was awesome, and that is my number five. Can you remind us a little bit about the growth of Tilly, Tilly in, in season three? So we see her in the course of this uh, season, and let me say this real quick. Can I, can I just give a little bit of observation for the season in general, or do you want me to hold that? Oh, uh, go right ahead, sir. All right, so having been on this tangent of watching each season – in its entirety. What I found in watching season three was the fast forward button happened quite a bit in season three. It didn't happen in season one and season two. The entirety of the mm. revelation of the barn was fast forward. I could have. Oh, Cal, come on, man. I, you know, I'm serious. The, it, toward, and it was an easy watch, meaning 
I binged from episode to episode to episode the two weeks prior. It took me three days because I was off work today. It took me three days, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to watch this entire season broken up because I didn't have that same motivation because I wasn't enjoying it as much. Is it just that you didn't give a crap about the burn, knowing the revelation? No, it really wasn't that. The this It was almost like, and I did not know until about 30 minutes ago, that the showrunner change happened. That's why I brought that up first. But mm. it felt like, whereas I'm commenting about season one, as you going back and you could see how they did one of the things that sto in storytelling that I love, which is you go back and you see how they sprinkled the revelation all through the season. And I even kind of felt that in season two, even though the showrunners between one and two were different. With season three, it almost felt like you had multiple ideas competing for the season and everything just felt like oh well let's try to keep an arc going no let's make them self-contained no here's the main story no it's really this and let's try to put them all together and now knowing that we have two showrunners it makes it make a little bit more sense because i'm wondering if you had competing voices that they then compromised because it, it just felt like there, it felt very disjointed is the best way I could put it. I didn't mm. feel like there was a complete narrative, even though there was, going back to my number five, there was some character growth across the board. And with Tilly, you see a particular moment where she and Stamets kind of have this moment where he berates her and then he comes back and he apologizes. And then you get to the point to where sh she is being as an ensign promoted to the first officer. And then everyone does this stand behind her moment. Mm. And I thought that that was really, really uh, good. And I really, really enjoyed that. So that's my number five with Tilly. Yeah, I'll add that Tilly has some great moments in the early episodes, her and Saru working together um, when they went to the tavern to try to see what was going on on that planet. Uh, she has some great moments in the season. I totally agree with that. Larry, you had some comments about the season before we even got into our review or even went on. We even came online to, to review this. You were saying some things about the season. Uh, do you care to reiterate some of those things right now? Sure. The the thing about season three was great is it had a lot of high moments for me. And we'll get into that with my, my five, because there's a couple in here that I feel um, are some of the best episodes of Star Trek I've watched. Now, granted, for this season, there's only probably two, but there were two that really struck me. And they hit me hard. They hit me really mm. hard because they were so good. But overall, I, you know, I'm like most people, the revelation of what caused the burn was, <laughs> was, it was anticlimactic, you know, and that's not a knock. I mean, there are other Star Trek shows that have done the same. That's not taken up for it, but I'm just saying sometimes they had more episodes to play with. So if Deep Space Nine started a narrative or Next Gen started a narrative or, or Voyager, they could course correct, right? Yeah. yeah. This one is so long, you know? So, I mean, it's just one continuous story that once they they started, you know, got on that train, there was no getting off. Mm. So, but, you know, overall, it's... I, the ending really, really was such a disappointment. And I think that's it. I think for me, that's where it lies. Mm. Is the ending was so like, what? That's it. Can I push back just a little bit real quick? Go ahead. I agree mostly with everything you said, Larry. The only thing that I disagree or push back just a little bit is the course correction. I think 
in the grand scheme of their writing, I think they had their course, whether it was disjointed or whether it had a dud of an ending or what. I don't, I'm going to assume, but I'm going to be pretty sure that they had already decided that this was the route they were going because of the way that they film isn't chronological in the way that we watch. Mm, yeah. Yeah, let, let me pick up a few comments real quick. We have our friend Charles Kelso saying that, I, I disagree, disagree about the fast forward. I thought season three was excellent and a big step up from the first two seasons. Now, mm, interesting, just interesting. to clarify, when I say fast forward, I mean as in watching, not that I d- did not like that they fast forwarded to the future. I loved them being in the future. But if, it, if that's what uh, Charles means, I love them being in the future. And uh, Tasha is also saying I feel like season three was a bit disjointed as well. And uh, when Grace mentions about they never talked about what happened to the, the lithium. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get my my number five. But I will say the burn revelation. And as Tasha says on her channel, we never talk about the burn. We're talking about it tonight. <laughs> the burn revelation was not my problem with the season. I thought, you know, when we were talking before, Larry, you mentioned that this is probably one of the most Star Trekky of the Discovery seasons we've we've had. They've kind of pivoted from pure action to more trying to get in that Star Trekky um, yes mode of operation. So I love I love the Burn Revelation. I, I I did have a bit of problems with it at the time, but I think as far as it being a Star Trek thing, I think it's good. I had a bigger problem with the whole Osira stuff. I, I I don't think I loved any of that. <laughs> so uh, let me go ahead and get my number five and we'll talk some more. My number five is going to be Michael Burnham's elation that she was actually able to get to the future uh, with the uh, entity data. Um, my favorite moment, pro- one of my favorite moments of the season, just when she just screamed out in pure joy that she had made it to the future and was able to send that last signal. So that's my number five. Um and, you know, it's it's a big I think that is the point where we see Michael start to take a pivot um, from being the pure Vulcan esque type character to be a little bit more human. Um, and, and she grows a lot. Let's talk about growth. She grows a lot in, in this season as well. Larry, what was your number five, sir? Mine was Booker. <laughs> David Ajala. <laughs> My boy. Number one, I I thought this guy was a great actor for so many years and seeing him on so many other TV shows on, uh, I think CW. the last thing I saw him was on Supergirl was the yeah. one he was on before this. I really enjoyed seeing him come into the cast. And at first I wasn't too thrilled. I was like, oh, we're going to have like a person who's not Starfleet be a main cast member. And then... I stupidly slapped myself and said, wait a minute, we had lots of great characters on DS9 who were not Starfleet characters, yep. you know. So, I, but I really warmed to him immediately. And glad he's still around. Yeah, it's funny because I think I warmed less or got colder on book as... Um, the the season went on i think i was still on board by the end of the, of season three but into season four i, I was kind of ready for him to like you know to me he was more in a way in the sense in season four but as far as him in season three i think he was a great character a great addition you know i talk about burnham uh become more open become more human he was a big reason for that mm-hmm. so yeah instrumental character in in season three i'm going to go ahead my number four since it's a cross closely related to what you just said mine is mike michael and book just their relationship seeing her let the guards down seeing her have fun seeing her smile i think one of my favorite moments of the season again is when she went to that colony i think in the first episode with book and um she's just like you know hitting all the emotions (laughs) i've never seen her do um so yeah just a wonderful portrayal by Sonequa Martin and David Ajala, these two, they're, they're great together. They're great together. Oh, you mean when they drugged her? I thought she was awesome yeah. when they drugged her. Yeah, when they drugged her, yeah. That was yeah. 
Great, great, great. Uh, especially the my, my favorite moment was, uh, God, I got a friend. You cannot give this to her. Talking about Tilly. Yeah. It's like, you do not want to give this to Tilly because if it does this to me, God help us. <laughs> Tilly doesn't need it. Uh, let's go ahead. Number four is Larry. What did you have as your number four, sir? Uh, my number four, I had to go over really, really hard because I know what my number one and two was, but my number three. Number four. What, number four. Number two, me. Number four was um I was trying to think I man I've for blanked on her name the lieutenant who stayed over from um uh non non yeah oh, commander non not yes. commander non excuse me commander non I really loved that we got to see her step out I love that actress you know had some correspondence back and forth and just told what a great job it was so great to see her I've been hoping, uh, you know, we would get her back and maybe she will be back in the last season, if nothing but for, uh, you know, a quick cameo. But yeah, she was she was phenomenal. So that's that's my number four. Oh, man. Yeah, I love her as well, man. I was sad to see her go. Cal Jones. All right. So before I give my number four, I want to make a comment, Clarence, on something you said about the Emerald Chain. This is my note that I wrote down before we got started (laughs) about the Emerald Chain. And it says, I didn't care for the green rope and I wished for a bucket of water every time I saw the Wicked Witch. (laughs) So that's that's my thought on the entire Emerald Rope or Emerald Chain and Osira. Uh, storyline was the green rope and the wicked witch let's just call it the green rope i like that better there you go green (laughs) rope but what i did like was my number four and right aligned with something that both of you said mine was the addition of booker i like the character even though i agree clarence that they put him in the way some uh as a character plot device in season four i think the actor brings a phenomenal take on the role and i love the actor and i love the character so number four edition of booker indeed book across the board (laughs) number four kyle go ahead and give us your number three sir all right so my number three was the awakening of the sphere data i liked how it's slowly becoming a sentient type character that is protecting and continuing to protect. I thought that that was classic Star Trek and I thought it was done in a very interesting and a unique way. So, yep, that's my number three, the awakening of the sphere data. Yeah, you, it's easy to forget that the sphere data eventually evolved into, um, wow, what's the name? What's the name of the AI? I'm blanking. I'm blanking. Nobody knows. In the chat, if you know the name of the AI that the Sphere Data evolved into aboard the Discovery, I don't know why I can't. Yeah. That's not this season? No, it begins to evolve. Okay. But it's uh, next season. Zora. 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 Yes. Yes, Zora. But we already saw her in the short trek. We did. We did. But next season, we'll see Zora. So, spoiler. Sorry about that. I was thinking it was this season. Um, Larry, if you'll go ahead and give us your number three, sir. My number three is kind of not just a top moment. It was a top moment for me. Kenneth Mitchell. Mm. Seeing him come back um, to play that character and that they brought him back, you know, as helping out with the Emerald Chain, even though, you know, he was going through the stages of dealing with that disease. And seeing him keep working, I loved the character in the sense that um, they had a character who was disabled but was still able to, you know, have a contribution, you know, to the show. So that's one, because I'll never forget that. I thought that was very cool to have him in and write this little story around him. Yeah. Amazing to have Kenneth Mitchell come back and play Aurelio. I didn't think we'd see him back in Discovery, but 
like you said, Larry, they wrote him in, they gave, gave him, they didn't just put him in there. He had a great impactful character and that was instrumental to the season. So yeah, just a great job of bringing him back. He did a wonderful job, man. Mm. Um, sad that he's not here with us, but, but you know, um, he gave us some great performances when he was here. So yeah, he really did. That's why I threw that one in there because it was, it was like I said, you know, it was kind of mere, you know, you have this character who's this person who's going through this thing in his real life and they wanted to bring him back and also showcase. I thought of like you talking about the wicked witch, <laughs> I, his character was more compelling than hers. Oh, I, I didn't say the Wicked Witch because she was compelling. I'm saying that she was a cookie cutter type villain. You are uh, right. You know, for what she did. He, yes, was very compelling. But her, I wanted to throw a freaking bucket of water on her the whole uh, <laughs> uh, time, every time I saw her because she was just your classic. And we see, we will see that again next week, you know, with season four. That's where I think discovery shifted away from great characters with the sphere data uh with the control last time and then it and it just so happens that these um two characters that i dislike are female which i love bad female characters but the way they're written and it's not the actor's fault but the way they're written is like eh. yeah yeah um Hey, do not talk about Lois Lane's niece or whatever she is. <laughs> oh man, let's 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 go ahead. I am gonna go to my number three, which is the tech. Uh, I think the tech in season three, being nine hundred some odd years in the future, is a fascination, but also a crutch. Uh, it. Well, no, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. it to me, it, it it makes everything a little bit too easy. So maybe it makes the story writing harder. When you have this nanotechnology that can do everything, um, <laughs> how many storylines can you actually have? Now, uh, even in the previous iteration of, of Trek, uh, technology still is very advanced and you would think it can get you out of every situation. So to say that the technology is an issue because it's this advance is really not an excuse because if they're good writers they can still get around it which i think they did to some extent but man this nanotech can do anything so um yeah it, it, it's a little weird to me i'm gonna <laughs> to disagree so with you on that clarence and i'm gonna tell you why i was the other day sitting here at my home remember i was born in 1968 i wanted a new game you go uh -huh. tell the store right Oh, no, I sat here in the living room <laughs> and ordered it online and downloaded into my console without even leaving my couch. I mean, you know, come on, 900 years in the future, everything should be easy. Like, you shouldn't even have to eat. You should just bean food into your stomach or something, man. I mean... <laughs> It's not that I don't like the tech. I just think it causes issues for writing. It could cause an issue for writing of the stories. That's all I'm saying. I'll be honest. I didn't think the tech went far enough. I said, this, really? This far into the future? Come on. We ain't going to have Stargates, man. I mean, we can't call them Stargates because yeah. that would be bad for them. But See, I was pushing back on you earlier, Larry. I'm yeah. going to agree a million percent with you because let me give you an example why. You said you were born in 1968 and you were talking mm -hmm. about how the uh, in the last 40 years, how technology just in a span of 40, 50 years has changed drastically. You know, and even if we look at it in a scope of a hundred years from the invention in the late 1800s, I mean, 1880s, 1890s of the telephone, et cetera, and how far we've come, you know, in a hundred, 120 years, I think I would have rather have seen Discovery go 300, 400 years in the future mm -hmm. as opposed to 900, because mm -hmm. I think the scope of how things could have changed in that many years 
I don't think they were true with how much things could have changed. Mm. Cause I, Kyle, I'm with you 100% on that. I agree with you. It's so far fetched 900 years. I mean, literally you should be remember the thing they introduced in the movie and they quickly didn't talk about anymore. The JJ Abram movie trans uh, beaming. I mean, dude, we should have trans beam. You should just be able, hey, I'm on Vulcan. Yeah, man, I'm just going to beam the earth because, you know, because I feel like it. Now, the only thing that I could add that could have slowed down that technological advancement was the burn. Yeah. And the fact that yeah. they said something you know, that is that, true that could have slowed technology advancement down, not having access like they did before or the regression of technology because they didn't have access. So that may be while they didn't bring that up, that could explain some of the retrofitting we'll call it of technology yeah. because you didn't have that expanse that they once had. Yeah. We couldn't even go to warp. So right. <laughs> it's pretty extreme. Uh, when grace mentions that it definitely feels like they stagnated, stagnated in evolution. I think that might be due to them not leaving the galaxy yet uh, and only keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, I, I agree, but I also agree, like you just said, Cal. I think the burn pretty much is the reason. So like that post-apocalyptic thing you see in a lot of shows where something really bad happens and then you got to go back to, you know, uh, not having any electricity and things like that. So look at Battlestar Galactica, how they, they in their narrative went back to non-communication and using yeah. old school telephone connections yeah. and what. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into our number two. Does anyone want to take number two first? Oh, I will. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. You haven't been with us. Go ahead. Go. I, I will on this one. It's easy. Number two. Uh -oh. Guardian of Forever. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> so good because I'm telling you, I have, for me, and we've often talked about this, the context for me is so much different because I've sat with so many stories on the Guardian of Forever in these, you know, ever how many years. I think I started watching Star Trek when I was six. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I've just been, we had it in numerous books. We've had it in comics. I mean, like I said, there's an audio book where they go back to get Spock's kid and they use the Guardian of Forever to do it. And one of the books should have been an episode or something, but at that time it wasn't in production. So, but the Guardian of Forever reveal was so freaking cool to me. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. Pretty freaking awesome. Um, did you, how did you feel about the Guardian being encapsulated, represented in Carl? Because if I had any I issues, I think that it. would be my issue. No, I liked it. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I didn't want to know it was the Guardian. I liked that where it was going from there. And then I think me and Tasha might have actually either talked about it. I know I talked about it with somebody. Um and I said, uh, somebody, they said it before I did. They said, man, I bet you it's the Guardian of Forever. And I went, <laughs> no. And then when it was and seeing the special effect of seeing the Guardian realized with, you know, whatever year that was, it came, what, what year was it? Two, 2021? Yeah, I when think so. Came, yeah. 2021. Seeing it with our modern day special effects come oh, to yeah. light oh it was glorious for me yeah it's pretty epic pretty epic not to mention the episode we got accompanied with that with seeing Giorgio go back and experience a possible version of her life um that was the all of that was beautiful and how she had changed as a as a person although I you know I still don't think you can ever come back from all the killing and genocide she did, but okay. I mean, hey, she's you know, eating Kelpians, dude. That's okay, man. I mean, we can make Darth Vader in the Valentine toys. So, I mean, we can forgive any sin as long as it's uh, fictional. Oh, boy. 
Uh, do you, uh, Tasha makes a great point here, saying that it would be nice if he showed up in the Section Thirty One movie. Do you think we will see Carl in the <laughs> Section Thirty One movie? Maybe white when she first gets there or whatever might show her walking through. Who knows? Hmm. Yeah, because that's how she actually leaves the show. Um, if I remember correctly, doesn't she go through the yeah, portal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we know have no idea where she's going. So maybe we will see Carl in the opening minutes mm. of the movie. Yeah. And I love the fact that the backstory, they didn't just throw the guardian in here as some crappy, oh look, the guardian of forever. Wow. And they actually went through the story of telling you that the guardian had people had tried to use the guardian as a, a means during the, the war, the temporal war. And that's why yeah. the Guardian moved itself from its original location to not get drawn in because, I mean, that would be the ultimate weapon if you could yeah. somehow get control of it. Yeah, you know, and they did. I, I will say, you know, I had complained about looking like they didn't have a narrative, but you do kind of see the writing on the wall going back and watching it again with the things that were happening to Giorgio and then the splicing her, of her face that was happening. And so you, you kind of knew going back again, what was coming. But I do remember after watching that second episode being pissed off at the end <laughs> because that meant she was gone and I didn't like that. So yeah, it's pretty sad. So Cal, if you go ahead and hit us up with your number two, sir. To pair with my number four, my number two was the addition of Her Majesty the Queen, Grudge. Oh, God. I love the cat. Oh, God. I'm are a cat person, a so I love the cat. I should have my Are You Holding a Grudge mug right now. That would be great. Yeah. I don't have my prop. Uh, but you do have a picture, and I'm putting it back up. <laughs> you know, I always hoped that Grudge would be more than a cat. Uh, but apparently he's not. Uh, I don't know. I, I just thought there was something else going on there, but very big cat. Very big cat. Yeah. Grudge actually, was awesome. Grudge is actually a she. Yeah. Oh, but, excuse me. That's why but, I told her the queen. Well, here's the, cool, here's the funny thing. It's usually a male cat that's playing her. You know, <laughs> they talk about that because the male mancoons are so... I used to have a, a, a person I worked with many years ago who was a breeder of Maine Coons. And the, ma the males are so huge. Hmm. Good on you for knowing that breed. I didn't know what breed that was. Yep, Maine Coon. And boy, if you want to buy one, you better have some serious cash in your pocket. Really? Oh, yeah. They can cost, I think was it somebody paid like 1500 Mm. from a licensed breeder and i think my man win grace has the ultimate comment right here about grudge and i see you here i see you what you're doing here win grace saying that could it be like isis from assignment earth who knows as cal likes to say who <laughs> knows oh i didn't put the pause in isis <laughs> that's a good call win grace because that's a deep deep cut yeah yeah that could be awesome and I want to pick up another comment when Gray saying that tonight we dine on Saru soup. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Uh, so we are ready for our number one. Well, let me go ahead and get my number two. And then we'll get our number ones. My number two is going to be Navar with the nice. included Spock flashback. Michael gets the revelation of all these great things that her brother has done since she has jettisoned off to the future uh, and center, seeing Leonard Nimoy on that that pr hollow projector, seeing the image of him come up, I just thought was freaking amazing. One of the best moments of the season by far. But yeah, and just the unification three, the unification that he started so long ago and we're seeing it play out all these years in the future where the Romulans and the Vulcans have all settled on on what is now called Navarre. That was Vulcan. a beautiful story. 
That was beautiful because you look at all the years and the war and the strife. And again, I'm going to refer to the books. I mean, I watched a, a book, uh, read a book called um, Under the Rafters Wings. There was also a book and it talked about the when the Romulans first split um, or became Romulans. They've split mm -hmm. from the Vulcans we know. And it, man, they they did some deep lore on mm. that. Mm. Yeah, I think is the deepest I've gotten is you know you get you get a few references in TOS of you know Spock makes some references, but in, in Enterprise you get some pretty good some pretty good lore on on their separation. And you know, just to go on the future, we see their eventual you know reunification. I think is pretty awesome. So yeah, great stuff there. Guys, are we ready to get into our number one? Yeah. And before we do it, I'm going to say uh, Tasha, Win Grace in the chat or anybody else who might be listening. What is your favorite moment of Star Trek Discovery season three? Drop it in the chat. If it's not one that we've mentioned already, we could probably pontificate on it just a little bit. Let's get into our number ones. Who wants to go first? All right. So I'll go uh, this time and I will be consistent. I don't know what I'm going to do next week with my number one, but I'll be consistent with season <laughs> one, season two, and say Giorgio's growth as a character. You know, mm. I, I see and I hear what you're saying, Larry, about can she be forgiven for the things that she's done? I don't think she's asking for forgiveness. You know, I think she acknowledges everything that she's done. That said, I think the character growth that we see when she's presented back into her old surroundings, it made me think of you can't go home again mm. and the impact that not Mira Burnham had had on her and Saru had had on her and not Killy had had on her and just <laughs> interacting with the discovery crew that she was on had had an impact. And I don't think she realized how big of an impact until she was put back into being for emperor yes. again. And I think that was, if anything, for me, some of the best writing of this entire season, that two parter, because it is completely character driven. You know, yes, you see the same actors playing different takes on their roles, but it was all character. The special effects weren't the story. The big bad wasn't the story. It was all character driven. So George O's growth ultimately as a character was my number one. That was awesome. I love the fact, I love number one when we have um, uh, him tell him, you know, no, don't tell her what's going on. We get to hear about Lieutenant Yor, who traveled from the alt from the yeah. next generation timeline, but from the um, JJ from the um, what it, Kelvin timeline. Yeah, yes. that's the first time we've ever got to see a character from the next generation era from the Kelvin timeline. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm. And you know, something that they did that I didn't pick up, and I'm sure, or I'm not sure if any of us picked up on it, and we may have, uh, but with that Giorgio episode, when she was in the Mirror Universe, uh, Arium was back, but in human form. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm, you know, and I love the fact that they took the time to invite some of these actors back that we hadn't seen for a while just for a one-off appearance or whatever, because it helps continuity. And I'm, I appreciate them doing that. Yeah. And I think we had the, we got to see the best Michael Burnham hair come back. <laughs> the flashback. Yeah. I don't know. I love the early hair of Michael Burnham. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, let's pick up a few comments real quick. Tasha saying, finally finding the lonely Starfleet attendant at the beginning was my favorite moment. The lonely, oh yes, you know I thought we were going to see more of him. I wish I remember his name, but he only bookended the season. We saw him at the be beginning. He was awesome in his in his little um, outpost with his holographic everything. 
<laughs> see, awesome. that was cool tech, man. Like yeah. even his bed and stuff was not a actual yeah. bed per. I, it was cool. It, it was, was just cool. awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, it, it's definitely a, you know, definitely something to get you hyped about what you may see in in this season. To start off with, that I thought was amazing. And then we get the book in at the end where he eventually comes to the new and improved Starfleet headquarters, which we haven't even talked about that. That was that was a whole other thing. Um, you have a comment here from Charles Kessel saying, I love the confrontation between Admiral Vance and Osira. That was one of the most interesting Osira, interesting Osira had been all season. I wish they would have continued to build on that episode and the Emerald Chain slash Federation rela- relationship. You know, for me, the Sour stuff, I I thought it was going to lead into more DS9 things. That's, that's I thought that was going to lead to, in a sense, although yeah. we don't really have a lot of Orions on DS9. But they, they kept hitting us with pieces of DS9 yeah. a little bit throughout the season. And but, instead of just killing her off. Yeah, yeah they shouldn't have killed her uh, because I think that would have been a good frenemy for a season yeah. going forward. Plus it was too easy. It's like, you know, don't just kill her off because I, I did not hate that character. I hated what they did with it. Mm. Yeah. I, it, I think if they would not have paired her with her second in command, the the guy from the very beginning, oh, that new boy. booker, I that I was him. so glad to see gone. You know, I yeah. was glad when he got it. I Because when I'm watching that scene where she's negotiating the peace deal. I had forgotten that he was still on the ship and I'm thinking, Oh, okay. I forgot about this. So they have this new agreement and then you switch to him and it's like, okay, this is never going to work. Yeah. And I think the reason they may have not have kept her around is because we saw Aurelio kind of come over to the good side by the end. So I, I, I don't know if they didn't want to do that with every character. Maybe they still need her to be bad, but so yeah, I'm, I think she, I think no, she would ahead. have been great going forward. It was unfortunate that it killed her off. Uh, just, just real quick in regards to what he mentions, what Charles mentions about Admiral Vance. I remember we watched this season. We were thinking Admiral Vance was bad the whole time. <laughs> we we thought he was going to be a bad guy, but lo and behold, he's he has kids and he's this mm-hmm. stand up guy and he's trying to get everything right. So, uh, bravo for Admiral Vance, Oded Far, if I'm saying yeah. that correctly. Got it, man, from the mummy way back old school. But you know what? Yeah, that was great writing because it's like, well, we could easily make him a bad guy. You know, he's just a dude trying to get stuff done. Indeed. Uh, Cal, I stomped on your comment a second ago. Do you, did you want no, to go ahead? No, I, oh, I wanted to ask you guys a question. Would you have rather have seen after she did the negotiation rather than go and stick with her quote unquote evil ways if she would have turned on her second in command dude and even killed him to keep that peace? Would you have rather seen that than what we got? Yes, that would have been. Yeah. Better. Seems like it would have made a little more, bit more sense, uh, but and I see then, why they, I see why they killed her though. I, I, but I, that, but then you don't make her uh, a one dimensional character. Then you really give her a lot of growth. Yep, yep. Because to me, you you know, you bring up the idea of one dimensional growth. I felt like I was seeing growth. Watch because I actually watched those episodes this afternoon. I actually felt like I was seeing growth and then you yanked any bit of growth you had. You took her back to being just your cookie cutter, Wicked Witch of the West because she goes right <laughs> back into being that. Oh, and we travel through the vast openness of the interior of the ship as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, when Grace mentions that I wish, I wish they had done a bit more with it, but I really like seeing the crew out of time aspect learning about their future, but the dif- distant, but the distant past to th- about the dis- distant past to the current era. Yes. I love the people a lot of time. We even had like a whole uh, post-traumatic stress kind of thing going on with Detmer uh, and the entire crew for that matter. We've had a Thanksgiving dinner to, the, <laughs> to try to get everybody on the same page. So that was interesting. I will say this season, I feel like they did, 
start to go into the rest of the crew more. And I appreciated that. Uh, Deadmer had her moment. I think we got a little bit more of Awasakan in the season as well. Uh, so, and Reese as well. Reese had some moments too. So I think they did a good job of starting to try to give us more of the rest of the crew. Now, it's not like shows of old when we had whole episodes that we were doing normal, normal space stuff <laughs> with the rest of the crew, but it was still good to have them integrated a little bit more to the overall narrative. So my comment I'm about to make is, I think the correct word is being a little bit hypocritical in the sense of me saying, Number four was the addition of Booker, and number two was an addition of a cat. So I think other than that, and here goes the <laughs> hypocritical comment part of it, is I would have rather have spent more time fleshing out these characters that we've already met in season one and season two than the time we spent. And again, I compliment the creation of the characters and the diversity that they bring, but the... Uh, you know, Adira and Gray, uh, I, mm. time we spent with them, S still create them, still have that one episode and see them again at the end if we wanted to, along with the, you know, Trill president or the chancellor or whatever she was. You know, that would have been fine. I'm not saying don't create the characters, but I would have rather that additional post episode time we spent with them, I would have rather have seen more of Bryce, more of you know, other characters as opposed to them. My personal preference. Yeah, Blue de Bar Barrio came on as a, I think she was, I think they were a principal actor in, in that season, uh, if I remember correctly. And I, yes. I know I know they are in the, the last, the, the current, current season, uh, or the last two seasons. So, yeah, it was a little disappointing to see them brought on and everybody else given a backseat. <laughs> but I, I did like the character. I love going I to do. Trill. I love going to Trill. I well, thought I'm that gonna was tell amazing. You, well, I might as well tell you that's mine. <laughs> My number one is when they went to Trill, that, that whole episode struck me so emotionally. I was mm. literally in tears on that one. Because mm. seeing her Go to Trill. I don't know what's going on. And I was so thankful that the Trill was not going to be Dax. I was yeah. like, man, there are more Trills out there than <laughs> just Dax. But uh, some people were really, oh, you know, it could have been, you know, all these hundreds of years, Dax could still be alive. And I said, sure, I guess. I mean, we don't know how long Simeon's lived, but 900 years. Is yeah, considering how long you know how old Dax was anyway, is a long time. But um, I enjoy. I I love that episode. I love the actor they brought in. He's been in a lot of stuff, but who played the caretaker? Yeah, that was. And awesome. when they went in and they did the whole thing, the only thing I didn't like, I didn't like michael beating up the guards and stuff right <laughs> off the bat i was like okay we let's not do that we have a little <laughs> tack but that episode blew me away like i said i was in tears i was like when she got out of the water and that man sits and he says speak your names and she does all the names of yeah, every so one cool. we had seen that was Star Trek at its best. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. I love that. Yeah. Pretty amazing. I probably didn't enjoy the fact that Michael got in the waters of, of that whole scene. To me, that was, uh, really, is she supposed to be in there? Uh, <laughs> I know. And sometimes you, you take the main character and you put, well, it's like we said about the original Star Trek. They put Kirk and Spock and McCoy in places. You know the captain in the first. Yeah, let's sit down the most three important people <laughs> to see what's on this planet. We're going to give them security detail? Nah. Nah, they'll be all right. If they do, they're wearing a red shirt and they get killed. Yeah. Which is really weird. You know what? I'm going to tell you something off camera about that. Some <laughs> guy, I don't know who it was. God help me that did it and actually went back and looked up 
the um, percentage of red shirts who bit the dust. And it's not as many as you think. <laughs> mm, really? Interesting. Interesting. May I do a future video about that? But that's my number. My number one. That touched me more than any other episode of that entire season. Well, I guess I should go ahead and get my number one, which is going to be the burn. Wow. <laughs> I know we love to hate it. We love to hate it. But as Larry has said, this might be the most Star Trekky of the seasons we got up into up until this point. And while there were aspects of the burn that I'm sure a lot of us at the time, because because we was we were theorizing so hard about this season. So mm-hmm. hard. Yep. We had so many cool theories, and it could be this, it could be that. And the actuality of what it was, I think, just was a huge letdown. But that said, in the aspect of this being Star Trek, to have this kid that's born on this dilithium planet and it's changed because of that. I think it, it works. It works. I think it works as a solid Star Trek premise. And I, I think it, it it really is a great aspect of the season, whether you like it or not. Uh, now, petulant child screaming, destroying the lithium across the galaxy. Yes, I can see why a lot of people are mad about that, as was I at the time. But, but looking back, uh, it, it it really was a good concept on paper. Maybe it didn't play out as well as they thought it would as far as people's reception, but I think it was a good uh, concept on paper. I want to pick up Wayne Grace's comment. He's saying, the concept and the mystery of the burn were great. The, res- the resolution was a big letdown, but the episode where they found the kid and the fake reality was really cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, go ahead, Larry. I was going to say, we we can, you know, you know, said we didn't like, here's the thing. I did like this, but I didn't like it being the end mm. of the show. I thought that left flat. Like if we had done this earlier and maybe it not been responsible, he not have been responsible for the entire burn or had just been a piece of it. This episode works, right? But yeah. being the climax of the entire season. And you're right. <laughs> we were a victim. A lot of this was our own doing. Let's be honest, because it's just like in uh, star Wars where everybody was, um, uh, Ahsoka. I don't want to spoil it, but there was a character in Ahsoka season two. We won't get into everybody was theorizing who it was, who it was, who it was. And it turned out that it was, a uh, yeah, kind of nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and that people were mad, but hey, that was us who yeah. went over the top with our speculation. And then we go, well, you should have done the thing that I was thinking. But, Even though, how can they do that? But, but they can't do that. They, they let us down some breadcrumbs, man. <laughs> you know, and I'm just saying, it's like, you know, everybody has their, but sometimes as fans, we love to speculate, but sometimes, What's in our head canon has nothing to do with what the writers are thinking. Mm, okay. So having just watched this and it is totally fresh in my mind. One thing I love about doing this podcast is on the rare occasion, Clarence Brown, when you and I actually disagree and respectfully disagree, I 1 million percent respectfully disagree. I do agree that the burn as a mystery was great. I did like that. I would have lo- and picking up on something Larry just said, I would have loved if they would have done like they've done in season one and two, that if we would have resolved the burn about three fourths of the way through and then dealt with the Emerald chain after that, I think that would have been a better, um, and I'm distracted by the actor who is playing <laughs> the child. He did an awesome job of a freaking, for lack of a better word, irritating character. 
Yeah. I would have rather have it been a fully grown Kelpian who accidentally got, who made this explosion happen and then got caught in some type of time loop or something where he didn't age or whatnot. And then they came and rescued him as opposed to, I'm a child and I'm having a tooth or transgen. <laughs> no, no. Just no. Well, that, well, now here in the child's faith, I mean, you are a child on a desolate, wherever it is, and your mama and everybody you knew died. That's fair. I mean, you'd probably be pretty upset. I mean, I like they shouldn't have went with it that way. That that's what caused it, but okay. it is what it is. All right, I am quite sure that I can throw a tantrum with the best of them, but I'm not going to have a tantrum that's going to make millions or whatever, thousands of ships blow up. Come on. Hey, I'm going to stand in the gap for Sakal, man. I am standing in the gap. I'm on his side. He was abandoned there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love the burn. I, I think that as far as Star Trek ideas, I love the idea you know we, we i think we can have a great discussion about is the mystery box right for star trek because because i feel like we kind of sort of did the mystery box in the first season but not really in the second season we definitely did it because we had all these lights appearing that uh, light years across and we're trying to figure that out in this season i think this is where they kind of go gung-ho in that uh, J.J. Abrams mystery box type of storytelling where we're going to give you these breadcrumbs, try to lead you in a certain direction, and uh, we got to give it to them because this is not anything we <laughs> thought of, but uh, as 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 it stands, I still think it, it, as far as a Star Trek idea, great. People receiving it idea, and even me receiving it at the time, no. <laughs> And with that, I want to go ahead. Oh, Tasha says, stand in the gap, Clarence. Yes, I'm standing in the gap. Um, A few honorable mentions, which I think we've done most of them. But I wanted to mention, we mentioned Trill, which was one of my honorable mentions. We mentioned Osiro, Emerald Chain, um, one of my honorable mentions. But I also want to say rebuilding the Federation. And I think Wingrace kind of, well, did he mention it? Someone mentioned it earlier about rebuilding the Federation. It may have been me. But the idea of the burn decimating everything, and we are essentially starting from scratch. There's no Starfleet Academy. Earth has banned it, <laughs> has, has told the Federation to leave because they're a problem and have formed their own forces That's... to protect the planet. Uh, so, yeah, the idea of the Federation kind of being cast asunder, and the whole point is to try to rebuild it from scratch, and Again, getting to that lonely guy on the outpost that was standing, staying at his post the whole time. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent, one of the many excellent ideas of this season. That was my, one of my honorable mentions was, was that because when they go to Earth and Earth, they just straight up was like, <laughs> look, look here, man, I'm good to go. We got everything we need. We don't need to be in the Federation. And your heart as a Star Trek fan is just going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't almost can't even comprehend Crazy. the Federation existing without Earth and Vulcan and of course Andor and Telar. You know, but yeah. 800 years. I won't say the word, but Stuff changes. <laughs> and, and I don't. I don't know if it was. In as we do with Star Trek, a lot of times you can relate it back to real life. But this was them essentially saying, "We're closing our borders. <laughs> yeah, we're keeping our yeah. resources. Nobody else is coming in. We have to survive. Uh, it can't get in here." Is what they were saying. Mm. So I don't want to um, 
you know, beat a dead Kelpian with a stick. But I want to bring up a comment that Wen Grace said in the chat, which is maybe instead of a tantrum, it could have been a station that required constant attention, like a nuclear power plant. And once the family had mm. died, he neglected to press the button. <laughs> You know, no, I, I get that. And, you know, he was a kid and didn't know what to do, had to be trained. And he's been and it makes it much more tragic. Right. If he yeah. has been on this station for, you know, decades or whatever, and he has religiously since that one time, you know, press the button, press the button. I think that would make it much more tragic. Yeah. Especially when you found this planet that is like, you know, finding a gold mine full of gold. And and the result of that is actually destroying everything. It's it's very tragic for that character. But I do like that that explanation there from Wind Grace. Definitely could have been an option. <laughs> so guys, as we wrap up here, anything else you want to bring up about season three before we kind of get out of here? Is that me? Oh, I will say that about the uh, Earth thing. I did not. You were talking about the burn. Good Lord. I didn't buy into the whole thing that the people who were attacking Earth were actually humans from, I think, where were they from? Titan? Yeah, I think that's what they said. And it's like, dude, like if you had all the resources to attack them and loot everything, don't you think you could have said, hey, man, it's us. <laughs> we're on Titan and stuff got messed up. Help yeah. us. I'm you. I'm you, bro. I'm you. <laughs> I mean, same solar system. That's still your backyard at that point in time. Yeah, definitely. I didn't really buy that. I was like, that's weak. All right. Well, we are wrapping up. Of course, next week we're going to be doing our best moments of season four before getting to watch what many people have seen already if you intended south by southwest or if you're lucky enough to get some of the screeners or some people have seen already the f the first two episodes of star trek discovery season five so i can't wait to get into that but we're going to be doing season four next week should be a lot of fun should be at the top of mind but honestly that might be my most forgettable <laughs> season <laughs> but we're going to get into it thank that, you got go yeah, ahead <laughs> yeah that season is uh not bad, but not great. I, I, if I had to rank it, I would rank this season above that season. I think I would, too. I think I would, too. Uh, while we get into it, uh, it's kind of hard for me not to <laughs> talk about it right now. It's very concept yeah. conceptual. Save it. Though. Save yeah. it. We'll yeah. save it. Uh, thanks to each and every one of you for joining. It's always fun when you guys jump in and help us talk out these seasons as it currently stands. And, again, we can't wait to get into season five when it gets here uh go around the horn real quick and see if if cal or uh larry want to give a shout out to anything before we get out of here i'll start with you cal anything you want to plug before we kind of wrap this up and get out of here sir no i'll just say as awesome as it always is enjoy the chat and look forward to next week and what about you larry oh just glad to be back and enjoy myself talking to you guys about star trek so yeah, and and before we wrap this up, I think we missed maybe the most important one of the most important moments of the season. Burnham becomes captain. Let's oh, fly. Yeah, <laughs> I think we all knew that was gonna happen. Yeah, so, um, so I was That's... just like, when when she gonna get the chair? Because what well, they kind of did her like they did um, Cisco. You know, Cisco started out as a commander. Yeah. And I mean, we eventually knew he was going to get to be captain, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. It's so, just win. Incredible growth moment for her. But yeah, thank you all for joining. It's been a lot of fun. So until next time.